one. The men manning the fortifications of Hakata Bay awoke to an ominous sight. The seas off the islands of Kyushu were teeming with hundreds of ships, a massed multinational armada intent on carrying out what would be perhaps the largest amphibious invasion ever seen anywhere in the pre-modern world. This fleet was just one part of a plan launched at the behest of the most powerful man in the world, Kublai Khan, to extract revenge on an impotent island nation of Japan. Arrayed against it were the skilled but outnumbered samurai warriors of the Kamakura Shogunate, organized by the leadership of the young regent Hojo Tokimune, tasked with defending their homeland for the great army of the Khan. The events that followed would live on as one of the most stunning and misunderstood defeats in Mongol history. A great defeat, a miserable defeat, a stunning victory, a Pyrrhic victory. Let's talk about it on this episode of No One Is Competent. This is the show. It is about people who fail. It is about nations and armies who fail. Generals, CEOs, people who you think are good, they're not so good. We're here to tell you how just bad at their jobs everyone is. I say we because I am Azalea, also known as Wyatt, your first host. And I'm Jay. Jay! My man with the plan. You uh you did a, you did a lot of heavy lifting for this podcast. This one's this one's really your baby. Yeah, um I mean Japanese history is a subject which I probably know quite a bit more um than really almost any other uh any other topic relating to history, especially pre-modern Japanese history. It's just something I've always been fascinated in. We're we're going to need to dig into that then. You know I think the only real problem this episode is it, it's really not going to piss anyone off. You know, like, our first episode probably pissed off the MAGA crowd. Uh, second episode, probably like, I don't know, white supremacist, glorious, western, fascist people. Third episode probably pissed off, like, neocon warhawks or something. Uh, who fetishized the Cold War. Fourth episode probably got the made the liberals a little bit upset. Fifth episode, uh, you know, is the the tankies are just fuming. They're <laughs> they are just absolutely throwing a fit. This one, um I I don't know. Are there are there any like revisionist Mongolian supremacists in our audience? I highly doubt it. I mean, I know the Mongols have their fanboys, and they generally like to downplay some of the more negative aspects of the Mongol Empire, but I think even they don't really claim the uh, the Mongol invasions of Japan to be some high watermark in their history. I mean, I'm a Mongol fanboy. I think they're pretty cool, you know, riding around on horseback, conquering, like, the entire known world, changing ethnographies of everywhere yurts yurts are pretty dope i like them aesthetically it's a, it's a good house they're, they're 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 round well it's it's like half house half tent and like there's nice carpets inside of it and 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 and, and goat's milk yeah and 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 goat cheese which i which i i think is pretty tasty i don't really like milk of any kind because i'm weird but no, no, yurts are dope. Also, the word yurt is pretty satisfying to say. Like, fast, lately, yurt, yurt. This is the No One Is Competent podcast. You're listening on Spotify, on Apple, on YouTube, wherever you're listening. Please rate us, give us a review that really helps us pump out this podcast to more people. If you're on YouTube, like and subscribe. And, you know, if you want to be a super fan, we really appreciate it. You know, we do this podcast with no sponsors, no pay, no commercials, uh, except for Jay's George, George Soros funding. Yes. We, we just power through this and put out this content for you. And if you really want to give back... Rate us on multiple platforms. You know, get in on there on Spotify, on Apple. Uh, liking and uh, commenting on the YouTube videos really helps us get that out to more people. 
we're in the comments of our YouTube section if you want to ask us some questions. If you want to speak to us more intimately, we have an email address, which I am forgetting, and Jay is about to tell me. Yes, that will simply be no one is competent at gmail.com. That's no one is competent at gmail.com. Again, this is the No One Is Competent podcast. I'm Azalea, also known as Wyatt. That's Jay. Our music is done by the legendary Sam Bryce. And I don't really think we're, we've got anything ever to do than to hop into the episode. So today, I, I kind of sort of set the scene earlier. But specifically, Jay, what are we talking about this evening? So we're talking about the Mongol invasions of Japan. Now, some of you might be familiar with the fact that they tried twice. We'll mostly be focusing on the second time, being in 1281. So the Mongol Empire is attacking the state of Japan in 1281, summer of 1281 to be specific. And in order to tell the full story of this battle, first we gotta ask a question. What are the Mongols? Now, the origin of the Mongols lies in the rugged steppe and plateau north of what is now mostly all China. Um, The Mongols were one of many of the steppe peoples who ranged throughout the Eurasian steppe. These people are famous for their skills in uh, horsemanship and archery, um, particularly the use of bows while riding on horses. And they were known throughout history to give trouble to large amounts of settled empires, the Chinese, the Persians, even the Romans. Now, famously, uh, for for those who aren't aware, steppe is like cold, rugged grasslands. Um, The American Great Plains aren't ever called steppes, though to my knowledge, it's pretty similar. Yes. Yeah, the the northern sections of the Great Plains are are pretty much steppe. And famously, these places are where herders live and eventually armed herders and that can eat and if you spend your life following around ba- giant bands of livestock either cattle or goats or whatnot it's really easy to sort of seamlessly transition into raiding various settled peoples you come across and in history over and over we see nomadic peoples really giving empires a hard time. You know, you have the Huns, you have the Aztecs, you have the Mongols. And you know, these these tribes and nations existed both in a state of competition with each other and with the other people of Asia. Sometimes they would unite into powerful political entities, and sometimes they would just fall apart and fight amongst themselves. And the Mongols are not the only steppe people, right? No. Of course not. They're, you know, in their immediate area. You have Jurchen, you have the Kipchaks, you have Tatars, um, and you have a, a whole slew of other groups. And, and these groups, they've been fighting with the Chinese since, like, there was a Chinese. Yeah, uh, people who are familiar with the history of the Han Dynasty might remember that they had a series of battles with a nomadic people called the, uh, the Xiognu, and I probably butchered that pronunciation. But um, their theory is that the Xiaonu were the ancestors of the Mongols, uh, that we don't know for sure quite yet. But for millennia, honestly, these peoples are hanging out around the Mongolian and Chinese steppes, and they're not really doing much that we would call historically interesting. And then around 1162... There's a boy called Timogen. And Timogen isn't exactly born to the height of the Mongolian aristocracy. He's the son of a minor chieftain, and he has a very violent upbringing, a series of disputes. He has to go rescue his wife. And by the time he's a young man, he proves himself to be a very competent leader in both battle and telling other people how to fight with him. And this allows him one victory into another into another. And suddenly he's uniting all of the various Khans of the Mongols. Khan is just word basically means big leader. And eventually he is named uh, the Khan of Khans. 
the Genghis Khan. Indeed, and, and that occurs in 1206. Um, he is declared that by a meeting of the Kurultai, the Kurultai being an assembly of Mongol chieftains. And we all see that Kurultais throughout Mongol history are what give legitimacy or take it away from Mongol rulers. So it's kind of like an oligarchy of the Mongol chiefs or, or khans coming together in a, to, to elect or decide on a leader? Yes, exactly. Now, Genghis and his generals would go on to subjugate the remaining powers of the steppe. They would defeat the Tongats, Tatars, and Khitans, as well as launch a series of devastating raids against the Jin dynasty of northern China and destroying the Khwarezmian Empire of Central Asia. You know, at the start of Genghis Khan's rule, the territory of the Mongols comprised of, well, rather conveniently, most of modern-day Mongolia, as well as some parts of Russia, Russia and China. By his death in 1227, the empire reached from the Caspian Sea in the east to the Pacific in the west. That's... how... That, that's bigger than the United States of America continentally? I uh, don't know off the top of my head, but it's probably wider, yes. So... Before we go further, I just have to ask, this guy leads this group of people who were mostly hanging out on their own to go out and conquer and defeat tons of our peoples. Uh, why? Well, you know, that's... When talking about why people do things in history, it could be a difficult subject, especially for pre-modern history. You know, we don't have diaries to rely on or interviews generally, so we can we can really only speculate as to what their motivations are. Uh, Genghis was probably motivated early on by the desire to provide security for his people. You know, uniting the Mongol people would help them stand up against the the Jin who had been meddling in their affairs for centuries. Um, you know, the, the clan that Genghis was from himself had been devastated by the Jin dynasty um, during the a uh, generation prior. And by then attacking and conquering the neighbors of the Mongols, that would further increase their security. There also does seem to have crept in a notion of almost a divine right to rule. You know, the name Genghis Khan means universal ruler. And we'll see... Um, as we go on to his sons and grandsons, they become imbued with a notion kind of similar to Manifest Destiny, that it's the right of the Mongols, as ordained by the gods, to rule everything that lies under the sky. And the sky, I don't know a lot about Mongol religion, but that's very important to the way like they see the world and the great step. Yes. So... We've gotten the why, and I've also heard a lot about how Genghis Khan is a man heavily also motivated by, by treasure and prestige. Oh, of just course, like yeah. Alexander the Great, Pompey, every great general under the sun. Extracting tribute and getting booty and loot were commonplace on the step, so that certainly played a role, especially for motivating the people following him. Yeah, the Mongols aren't state makers exactly but they're really good at taxing trade they kind of like states to exist and then they just sort of take off a cut on the top of what the states are making uh, when they go on to take over the states themselves well we'll see how that goes but uh, let's also get to the the how like how does Genghis Khan just utterly obliterate everyone in his path? So when talking about the how, it's uh, important to, I suppose, refresh ourselves on the Mongol way of warfare. As mentioned, these people are horsemen, in particular horse archers. Now that's not unique. Most of the other steppe people were also horse archers, just as skilled as the Mongols individually. What Genghis really brought was a drive to reform the military of the Mongols away from the traditional family and clan-based organization to something which is much more modern, 
You'd have permanent units based on uh, numbers of 10. So you'd have 10 men making up the smallest, and then that would go up to 100 men, 1,000, and then 10,000. And these would be run as a meritocracy. They would also be very well drilled in sophisticated maneuvers. The Mongols were famous for being able to coordinate attacks over large amounts of terrain, swarm enemy armies, and then disappear before reinforcements could arrive. You know, even if you had the Mongols and one of their enemies with roughly the same amount of men, Mongol coordination would mean that they'd be able to outnumber and overwhelm the enemy and basically defeat them in detail. Two points here. One, what you're describing sounds a whole heck of a lot of what made the Roman Empire successful. Yeah, there are definite similarities between the, the legions and the way the Mongol army was organized under Genghis. Secondly, obviously completely coincidental, but secondly, so so these people, they did have occasionally a technological advantage. You know, they got really good bows and horses make you very mobile, but it's political technology that allows Chinggis to conquer all of this ground. And also, yes, we, we know that a lot of people say Chinggis Khan is more accurate the, the guy's name was Temujin. Most people know him as Genghis Khan. That's what we're saying, Genghis Khan, because we try and be accessible as a podcast. Uh, send us an angry email. We don't care. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely the organization and the political structure that really allows Genghis to do what he does. The, now, these promotions, who who were they like like available to? Could Could just like, Anybody in the Mongols start leading people if they were sort of showed their medal on the on the battlefield? This guy takes over so much territory. Was it just Mongols in his army? Oh, certainly not. No, I mean high level generals wind up joining the Mongols from other tribes from the steppe and even from China and Persia, and serving directly under Genghis. Um, the armies would very quickly become multi-ethnic and multinational. They really needed to do so so they would have enough men to keep up with these ever-expanded conquests. So by taking in other groups of people and other generals, which of course gives him access to the technology and the tactical knowledge that those generals have, which, for example, is why the Mongols don't really get slowed down by learning siege warfare. They pick that up pretty quickly. This allows them to essentially snowball into easily the largest threat on the entire continent. Now, after Genghis Khan dies, Ogadai, his third son, would become uh, the, the Khagan. That's that's like the technical term for yes. the Great Khan? yeah. Under Ogadai, the Mongols would finish off the Jin dynasty. They'd push into Korea, which, remember, is, is quite north geographically. They'd conquer Armenia and Georgia on the other side of the continent and most of the Kievian Rus. And for those who know your Russian history, you know the Mongol conquest is generally when Russia history starts. So that's pretty um, historically significant. They'd push, go all the way into Poland and Hungary. After Ogadai, you have two short reigns of Guyuk Khan and Monka Khan um, basically consolidate the empire, and they start to really push against the Song Dynasty, which is one of the great dynasties of China. Yes. After Monka died in 1259, apparently they weren't able to uh, choose another Kagan very easily. I guess the cruel tie was divided. And you get uh, a bit of a civil war uh, between uh, Arik Bokwa and Kublai. And Kublai would win the civil war, becoming Kublai Khan, Kagan of the Mongols. Kublai being... Genghis' grandson directly. Yes. Now, this would begin a fraction, uh, a fissure in the Mongol Empire that would eventually kind of spell its doom. Um, for a while, it was kind of just, ah, the people in the East, they don't really like Kublai, and eventually things would get a whole lot worse. But 
for now, Kublai is setting his sights on China. For, for those not aware, you know, China at this point is arguably the most successful empire, civilization, generator of culture and cool technology, whatever you want to call it, that the world has ever seen. Especially this part of the world has ever seen. And China, like the idea of China, has tons of legitimacy in it. Yes. And being the, the, the emperor of China is considered a, an almost godly figure. Very similar th- that we would think of like the Egyptian pharaohs to these people. Yeah, it's quite literally the, the son of heaven. And so if you could be emperor of China... You have a spiritual, religious mandate that no one else can contest. So Kublai is raised by Chinese tutors. He embraces the traditions and bureaucracy of imperial China. He builds his capital in what we now call Beijing. And he sets up not only just a new Mongol dynasty... But he declares the Yuan dynasty of China. So he is both Mongolian and Chinese. Yes. And that's a very important thing to remember. You know, throughout this podcast, we will be talking mostly about, you know, the Mongols and the Mongol invasion of Japan. But it's really the Mongol and the Yuan dynasty invasion of Japan. Because Kublai is both Khan of the Mongols and emperor of China. And after he takes over China, it's not like every person who's ethnically Han Chinese in the emperor's in the empire is killed, right? They they're part of the army. That's the way this works. And yeah. it's going to be a lot of Chinese soldiers also invading Japan. Yes. Which uh leads us to the question, uh, what is Japan? Now, Jaharis, earlier, you, you hyped me up a little bit. You, you talked yourself up. You're a big, big Japanese history nerd. This is your, th- this is your opportunity. So, th- so Japan, it's an island nation. There's like three or four big islands, and it's like the size of California. So you're correct in that, mo- uh, at least in the modern day, we consider Japan to have four main islands. Uh, going from the north to the south, you have Hokkaido. That's up towards Siberia. You have Honshu, the biggest of the four islands. Um, people who are, who've ever seen Japan on the map, uh, you know, the long, almost banana shaped island is Honshu. Then, then towards the southern tip of Honshu, you have Shikoku, um, facing towards the east, so into the Pacific Ocean. And you have Kyushu, right at the south. Um, Kyushu is where the city of Nagasaki is. Uh, at this point in time, Hokkaido is not under the control of the court in Kyoto, so we can pretty much ignore it. And we'll actually be spending the bulk of this episode in Kyushu, right at the south of Japan. So, everybody knows about Japan, whether you're a giant anime fan, or you play Final Fantasy games, or Nintendo games, or you like sushi. Much of their history sort of looms large in popular culture. People love ninjas, people love samurai. But but this this here Japan we're going to talk about, this is not the Japan that people probably are thinking about when they picture medieval Japan in their brains. Yeah, most people are probably thinking of the Sengoku period when they think of, you know, pre-modern Japan. That's where you have famous figures such as Oda Nobunaga and Toyotomi Hideyoshi. That's where you get the great battles of Okahazuma and Sekigahara, where you have the origins of the ninja and the daimyo. And really that sort of dominates how we think of Japan and Japanese warfare. But this was much before that. At this point in time, so in the 1100s, fighting was common but it was waged at a much smaller scale. Armies rarely consisted of over a few thousand men, and the bow reigned supreme as the primary weapon of the samurai. Uh, Japan was politically fragmented with a relatively weak central government and a far smaller military than those of the continental powers crushed by the Mongols. 
And now, because our story begins in 1281, we are going to launch into a violently brief rundown of the Japanese history that had to happen before we got to this point, <laughs> a la Mr. Jahari's Brunstead. Jay, take it away. So I suppose I'll begin with the Yayoi period. Um, that's not the first period in Japanese history. You have the Jomon period beforehand. But the Yayoi period is where the ancestors of the modern Japanese people begin to arrive in Japan. This is around the 5th century BC. And they bring with them wet rice agriculture and an early form of the Japanese language. Um, Over the following centuries, these people would assimilate and displace the native Jomon population of Japan from Kyushu, Shikoku, and eventually Honshu. Uh, by the first and second centuries, you had the emergence of what are called kuni, small little countries, often consisting of only small, you know, singular settlements and villages. The most powerful of these kuni, such as Na, Izumo, and Yamatai, began to dominate their neighbors and form larger confederations. These even entered into the Chinese tributary system. So quick pause. So first off... The folks that we now think of the Japanese, they are ethnically from the mainland. They are not in, ne- necessarily indigenous to the island, though, you know, going back long enough, you know, what does indigenous even mean? Correct. Um, and also, they are going to be caught up for a long time in the Chinese sphere of influence. Remember, I said the Chinese empire is, is huge, and it's very politically important to the people who live in this part of the world. You, you have to pay tribute. You have to give money. Uh, and gifts and favors to the Chinese, or they'll come in and wreck your shit, and that's what the Japanese are going to be doing, along with everyone else in this slice of the world. Yeah, I mean, if you've ever seen any Japanese writing, you see the symbols they use. Kanji are Chinese characters. all Chinese characters. Yeah. (laughs) You know, there's a passage in the records of the Three Kingdoms talking about the king of Na from the land of Wa, so one of these kuni in Japan, paying tribute to the Chinese court and receiving a gold seal in return. And we actually found this seal in just buried under a farm in Japan in the in you know a few centuries ago. It's a fascinating historical artifact that just backs up um, at least a lot of the written records of the history of Japan from Chinese sources. And there's no war between between the Chinese and the Japanese to start extracting this this tribute. That you just do it because that's just what you do. And so when I talked about why uh, Kublai and the uh, Khan leaders that came before him, why they were so obsessed with becoming the Chinese emperor, that is what being the Chinese emperor conveys you. Yes. Yeah. So getting back on the track of Japanese history, from the 4th century through the early 8th um, period, which altogether we can call the Yamato period, um, that's what sees the emergence of the Yamato Kuni um, as the dominant power in Japan. This will be the what will become the Japanese state, basically what will become the court in Kyoto. Is just the Yamato just the ruling family? Is that just what their last name is? Their clan name? Yeah, yeah, Yamato refers to both the clan and the ruling family. And then eventually, I mean, people will talk about Yamato Japanese as the entire ethnic group of modern Japanese people. They come from the region of around Nara. They established their first capital in Nara um, in the 7th century, though they eventually replaced that with uh, Heian-kyo, modern-day Kyoto. And that would start a period known as the Heian period. Uh, The Heian period would see the direct power of the emperors, who had their origins as the kings of Yamato, fall to the wayside as courtly families such as the Fujiwara rose to dominate politics. This is also when the government in Kyoto conquers the remainder of Kyushu and northern Honshu. Now, 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 Kyushu and Honshu are those are islands, right? Yes, Kyushu. So we, is so we have two, island, I, two and, islands secured right now. Yeah. Oh, they already had Shikoku at this point. Basically, the re- remaining resistance to their rule was northern Honshu, so right across from Hokkaido, and southern Kyushu. So you can think of the far-flung reaches of Japan at that time. 
and during the Heian period, they would fully subdue those areas, though their true control on the ground remained a bit tenuous. You know, this is just like going back to last uh, second, well, say last week's, but this is an every other week podcast, the Afghanistan episode. This is how most empires work. You know, there's some guy who's technically in charge, but at the village level, you know, things are a little like, eh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, the sky is very large, and the emperor is far away. Indeed. Now, the Heian period is popularly remembered as the high water mark of classical Japanese culture. Art, poetry, and literature flourished. If you've ever heard of the tale of the Genji, that's from this point in time. Most I, the- as a as a lit crit poetry nerd, I, I've read a bit of Heian uh, poetry. It is. Heavily emo, almost Aztec levels of emo, by the way. <laughs> Read Aztec poetry. It is awesome. And ham poetry. I, I love it. Even in translation, it's very nice, in my opinion. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cool stuff. Uh, besides people dying their teeth black. That's creepy, but you know, <laughs> uh, different strokes for different folks. Yes. Now, the ham period would also see the rise of a class of hereditary warriors what would become commonly known as the samurai. The term samurai originally just referred to lower-level bureaucrats, but it later gets applied to these people as well. Um, in, in Japan, they would have used terms like bushi and buke. The origins of the samurai lie in the mounted warriors that the court relied upon to subdue the emishi, who were the people of northern Honshu, when their infantry-based conscript armies proved insufficient. Now, as the power of the Fujiwara waned in the 11th and 12th centuries, offshoots of the imperial clan and of Western noble families began to build alternative power bases reliant on martial ability and forging alliances of these samurai families in the countryside. Uh, the two most powerful families, the Taira and the Minamoto, would end up destroying the power of the Fujiwara and fighting between themselves for rule over the country with the Minamoto coming out on top in the late 12th century. And so the Minamoto are the new guys in charge. They want a new capital, so they're going to establish a new capital a little bit to the east, and they are going to very creatively name it the Eastern Capital, Tokyo. Not quite. That will be a few centuries down the line, though their ah, capital shoot, is... I was being clever. <laughs> their capital is close to modern-day Tokyo, um, but theirs is Kamakura. Uh, that gives us the term Kamakura period, as well as... See, the... Jay is the history nerd. <laughs> I am just a poser. I am just on this podcast because I have a very pretty voice. You're correct that uh, Tokyo does mean Eastern Capital, but um, it doesn't become the capital into the uh, Edo period with the Tokugawa. Um, but yeah, so I'll be using throughout this episode probably the term Kamakura Bakufu. Um, Bakufu... Uh, just refers to the government uh, that's based the, in Kamakura. The, the, let's call it the Kamakura government. The, these, that's the people, the Kamakura dynasty, the Kamakura empire, yeah. whatever you want to call them. That, that is the power that's going to be fighting the Mongols. Yeah. Though, it's also worth mentioning, it's not the Minamoto themselves. The uh, Minamoto claimed the title of Shogun. Whoa, whoa, before whoa, 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 the Minamoto? We got a lot of proper nouns flying around here. The, the Minamoto are the family who just defeated the Tyra. But the Minamoto... Uh, so where does the word Kamakura come from? It's the name of the city. Okay, so the Minamoto found Kamakura. Yeah. yeah okay, it, got, it, it, if you got, remember, it, got it, got it, got like, it. A minute ago, I described the, the Tyra and the Minamoto and their war. Like two minutes ago, <laughs> I'm I I'm listening. I I I'm, I'm fiddling with knives and fidget cubes, but I am listening. So the Minamoto claimed the title of shogun, but following the death of the first Minamoto shogun, uh, true power passed into the hands of his wife's family, the Hojo, and the Hojo are the ones who would rule Japan. Uh, they would rule it through the position of shikan or regents, um, in Rather traditional Japanese fashion that sets up a very kind of amusingly large system of power where the Hojo Shikan rules for the Shogun, 
who is in turn ruling for the Kyoto court, who is in turn ruling for the emperor. Of course, true power lies in the hands of the Shikan. Not gonna lie, my brain kind of glazed over there for a bit, but the Shikan's in charge. Yes. Okay, got that. What's next? So the Chinese-style administration of the Heian period survived by the severely weakened state. The Kyoto court continued to appoint magistrates and governors, but they had very little power. Meanwhile, the Shikan and Kamakura appointed military governors known as Shugo to administer the countryside. Technically, this was a meritocracy. These people were not appointed for... um, This was not a hereditary position, and it was not an appointment given to somebody based on birth. But in practice, powerful families would come to dominate the positions of Shugo. And these families maintained their own samurai retainers and often fought in small-scale conflicts between themselves. Now, obviously, these people are cribbing most of their their culture and administration style from uh, China. Like, I'm sure that they've, they've got kind of similar tests to get into these bureaucracies, similar to like what the Han, Han Chinese pioneered. Um, the, you know, any test is easy to corrupt, just ask the SAT. But... Uh, are these people still, like, in the Chinese sphere of influence at this point? So, no. Uh, Japan had actually left the tributary system. We don't quite know when, but during the, uh, during the, by the end of the Yamato period, um, they stopped paying tribute to China and would only briefly resume to do so at one point in the 15th century. Um. Okay, so this, uh, this... So this Kamakura period, uh, Minamoto Japanese government that's kind of weak and Hojo. kind of hmm? Hojo, not Minamoto. Yes. Yeah, so this uh, this Hojo clan ruling over the Kamakura period of Japanese history that's kind of splintering and having a lot of families trying to amass power and using samurai to fight amongst themselves these are the folks that are going to be facing off against the mongol empire yeah and who is going to be standing at the helm standing at the helm opposite of kublai khan was the young hojo tokimune who was only 23 years old at the time of the first invasion uh, tokimune was an energetic self-assured ruler groomed for power from a young age his father actually retired uh, to allow Tokimune to take the position of Shikan and thus preventing a secession struggle. That's smart. Yep. And like many other Hojo rulers, Tokimune was a fervent patron of Buddhism and a strong believer in the faith. Um, this period would be a period that would see Buddhism flourish in Japan. And many of his advisors were Buddhist monks who had a fair bit of knowledge of Asian politics. Now... We said earlier that Japan had left the Chinese tributary system centuries in the past, but that doesn't mean that they don't know what's going on in the mainland. You know, these people trade with Song Dynasty China and Korea, and so they see Kublai Khan going to war with the rest of the Song Dynasty. This is what Kublai Khan does for the the first few decades of his reign, it would be a very long, very bloody war. The Song would hold on for years uh, in uh, southern China, but they would fall just as everyone had fallen before them. And the Japanese, they see this going on. They see the refugees that are flocking from China and Korea to Japan to escape Mo- Mongol persecution. Um, and they're relatively sure that the Mongols are eventually coming. A lot of Buddhist monks are coming over. As Jay mentioned, uh, Tokimune thinks pretty highly of Buddhist monks, and they actually suggest that he surrender to the Mongols, because at this point, Mongol brutality in them oh, I don't know, burning entire cities to the ground, raping all of the women, enslaving people, ethnically dispersing people. That is very well known. And actually, the reigning emperor seems to have been convinced. He, uh, jumping a little bit ahead of myself here, but he did entertain the possibility of recognizing Kublai as, you know, the, uh, as a sovereign, but 
Hojo Tokimune would have none of that. So by 1266, Kublai is well in control of all of mainland China, correct? No, the Song Dynasty is still around and will still be around until 1279. But that will actually be after the second invasion. But regardless, Between Kublai the two is like really... Kublai is ruling out of Beijing and he's like really consolidating his power. And in 1266, he sends his first envoys over to Japan. Uh, The Japanese is kind of like, yeah, whatever. And obviously, internally, there's some debate whether or not we should recognize recognize this guy. But Kublai, he gets pissy. And just like he told his generals to draw up plans to invade Korea or Lower China or various other places out in the West before. He tells the boys to get together and uh, let's go show these uh, island backwater hicks what's what. Yeah, and we don't know exactly why Kublai picked Japan as his next target, but there's several plausible reasons. Uh, Simply proving his strength to his new vassals. It could have been lobbying on the part of the Korean king. There's some evidence towards that. And it could have simply just be punishing Japan for their continued trade with the Song Dynasty. Um, oh, and also we did talk about earlier, the Mongols at this point do seem to genuinely believe that they have a god or god's given right to rule the universe. Also, there's the fact that Kublai sees himself as a continuation of Chinese divine power and in the previous centuries Japan had been defying that power and if he would bring them into the fold that would give him even more legitimacy as the Chinese emperor. Oh for sure to bring a former tributary state who had long split from the system back under Chinese control would be a big uh, would, would look very good to his new Chinese subjects. So in 1273, a very important Song Dynasty city called uh, Zhenyang falls to Mongol forces, and that allows Kublai to focus his um, and that allows Kublai to focus his efforts on Japan. Uh, In November 1274, an invasion force of 22,000 soldiers aboard 800 ships. Uh, Here, I'm going to take a brief aside to mention it's hard to get accurate numbers for either of these invasions. Historical sources inflate them wildly, um, as is common uh, when talking about pre-modern warfare. Uh, The numbers we're using are approximate guesses as to how strong they were. Probably not 100% accurate. But you get the, the general idea of what's going on. This is still a massive army for the time. Yes. Uh, Bigger than it is that had Japan ever faced a 22,000 man army before? Like uh, Very likely no. If you think of like the battles of the Hundred Years War in Europe uh, a few centuries later, most of those um, did not have 22,000 men on the individual side. Now, as late as the English Revolution, the idea of getting t- together a, like we're talking Renaissance era... 1600s Europe, the idea of getting together a 30,000 or 40,000 man army was almost preposterous. Yeah, it would be a a, a big deal. So they're coming over in ships and deep sea ocean travel, this is more or less the exact opposite of what the Mongols are good at, at, you know, clopping over the great grassy plains of Europe. So they've got the Koreans building the ships for them. Remember, the Mongols conquer peoples and then assimilate their technology and politics into their own. Yeah, so as you mentioned, the bulk of the navy was provided by the Koreans, and the soldiers aboard these ships were a mix of Mongols, Koreans, Chinese, and various other subjects of the empire. Now, now quick question. Were the Koreans good at this? Like, like... I know a few hundred years down the line, for instance, the Ming Dynasty will make massive flotillas of ships that are really great for deep sea ocean trade. But like crossing an ocean, even the distance between Korea and Japan, 
that's hard anyone who's not a sailor like the ocean is big it kills lots and lots of people in pre-modern history and you need a very sturdy ship to cross it are they properly equipped so the Koreans at this time, um, this being under the Goryeo kingdom, um, they were good sailors. Um, they, their Korean traders would frequently go to Japan and China and elsewhere in Asia. Um, so they certainly know their way about. However, they probably didn't have a navy actually large enough to carry this invasion force. They had to construct new ships very quickly. And they were probably putting a lot of people in service who weren't as experienced um, of sailors as uh, as you would ideally want. My understanding is that the construction of this navy and whatnot, this, this would cause quite, quite the strain on the Korean economy at the time. Oh yeah, there, there were even revolts in Korea, and that's something which alerts the Japanese that something is going on. Because again, you have traders going back and forth between Japan and the mainland. They're not isolated from, from continental Asia. The Japanese being made aware that there was some sort of preparation for an invasion of Japan, then allowed Hojo Tokimune to try to guess where the landing site would be. His guess was a part of Kyushu known as Hakata Bay. Uh, why would the Mongols attack Hakata Bay? Well, Kyushu, being right across the Korean Strait from, well, Korea, would be the logical first place for the Mongols to land. If you have a big army on a bunch of ships, you really don't want to spend large periods of time at sea. Um, you want to go on the shortest route possible. And Kyushu itself was relatively backwater at this point in time. It was not very well developed. Most of the cities, such as Nagasaki, did not exist at this point in time. The most prominent city on Kyushu and the administrative capital was uh, a town known as Dezaifu. And Hakata Bay is the only bay big enough to support a large fleet of ships that is close to Dezaifu. So the Japanese correct, the Japanese guess, as it would turn out to be correctly, that the Mongols would land in, in Hakata Bay. So this is the first invasion. Obviously, we're calling it the first invasion and kind of spoiling stuff a little bit. But in 1274, the uh, Mongols uh, come over. Now, I know at least somebody listening to this podcast, Hey Logan, uh, is thinking about a very recent popular video game that came out called Ghosts of Tsushima. Uh, named after the island of Tsushima, which is going to be one of the first place the Mongols land. Now, obviously, that video game is uh, a sort of historical fiction, basically, of what if, if this uh, invasion went way better than it actually did. But, you know, we, we fans of the game, uh, we, we see you. Uh, we're glad that this period in history is, is getting some attention and yes, the I, whatever happened on it, the island of Tsushima was one of the first uh, places these uh, Yuan Mongolian uh, troops would go before uh, staging their assault uh, to land at Hakata Bay on November the 19th of 1274. Yes. Now, Hakata Bay was defended by between three and 6,000 Japanese warriors, uh, many of whom were manning fortifications that had been built six centuries prior when the Japanese feared invasion by the uh, Tang Dynasty. So, so they're built in a little bit, but not, not too great. They're pretty old, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not the best uh, fortifications, so I suppose anything is better than nothing. So... On November 19th, the, they make contact. Now, the, the whole plan here, obviously, the, the Mongols, the, they are not Marines. The, you know, they don't... Beach warfare, if you've ever seen the film Saving Private Ryan, uh, it, it's hell. It's, it's bad. It's bad no matter what level of technology you're, you're working with. It's bad. Not even the Vikings totally liked doing it, and they were great at it. It's, it, it, it's heavy. It's wet. It's disgusting. It's, it's vile. A lot of people die. Obviously, what the Mongols want to do is they want to 
kind of skip over that part as quickly as possible. They want to get in, they want to establish a beachhead, and they want to establish uh, a sort of base on the mainland where they can get their horses going and then just sweep over uh, most of the island and do what they've always done. So if the Japanese are ever going to beat them, they're going to do it here or they're not going to do it at all. Jay, tell us a little bit about what this first battle of Hakata Bay is like. So the Japanese defenders do put up a very stiff resistance, um, you know, covering the Mongol attackers with arrows. But the Mongol army was able to breach Japanese lines in multiple places, thanks to both their overwhelming fire uh, from arrows and gunpowder bombs. This was um, something totally new to the Japanese. They had never seen gunpowder weapons before. But the Mongols brought over what would be basically similar to uh, something like a hand grenade, small iron bombs filled with powder that could be thrown or rolled at the enemy. Yeah, so think about uh, sort of formations of several dozen Japanese archers at a time. You're standing behind these fortifications. They're firing on Mongols as they're getting off of their boats. Um, the the Mongols, they're getting off their ships, they're lobbing these grenades, trying to break up these these wooden and stone structures that have been built. You know, these things are centuries old, so they're, they they go down pretty easily. And the Mongols, they take a lot of, uh, they take good casualties, but they, they still are able to push through and actually uh, take the town of Hakata, the, that Hakata Bay is, is named with, uh, by the evening. Correct. But rather than pressing their attack, the Mongols decided to withdraw the bulk of their forces to their fleet for the evening. Um, we don't exactly know why. We do know that one of the top Mongol generals had been injured by an arrow, and it's possible that they feared they might be falling into a Japanese ambush. You know, the fake retreat was a tactic the Mongols used on many occasions, so they would have been wary of their enemies using it against them. But it's worth pointing out that on November the 19th, the fall of November... The, so, But it's worth pointing out that on the evening of November the 19th, in 1274, th- this is about as good as it's going to get uh, for the Mongols in for, as far as invading Japan. This, this is kind of their high watermark. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Everything from here is uh, going to go downhill. And what followed... Uh on the 20th, is a matter that's subject to some debate. What does seem to be true is that bad weather struck the bay following the Mongol withdrawal. The Mongols certainly intended to continue their attack, but according to Japanese sources, a wind rose up that dashed some of their ships against the shore and caused the remainder to withdraw. Now, Mongol sources claim that a large portion of their ships were sunk by the weather in a great typhoon. It's hard to know if this is true because the Japanese don't mention this typhoon. Um, it could simply be that the Mongols were trying to save face to blame a big defeat on the weather. Or it could be that, you know, they actually really were hit. Yeah. Like, remember, they have 22,000 people. The Japanese have, like, at most 6,000. And, again, we really don't know what happened on the 20th, but if, uh, you you know, the Mongolian commanders get whooped by this Japanese army and they have to go back to Beijing and bow before the Great Khan, a a typhoon, it was a, boss, it was a huge typhoon, waves, waves bigger than than sand dunes, I I tell you, they they were bigger than a house, they they were bigger than a pagoda, they were rising up and all the lightning, it was crackling, it was was blowing people right out, out of the water, setting things on fire, the wind, it was howling so loud I couldn't hear myself, boss, it was huge, it was like God was trying to strike us down. I'm glad that your Mongols speak with, like, a a Jersey accent. (laughs) I mean, whenever I need to make fun of somebody, uh, they just become another Yankee. That's just the way you do it. (laughs) Yeah. And the sort of the story of the kamikaze or divine wind would become useful after the fact for the Buddhist clergy in Japan. The Buddhists, uh, you know, Buddhist monks were praying um, to... 
Buddhist monks were praying to for the gods to intervene against the Mongols, and this was used as evidence for their for their influence and their power. Um, it'd also be a useful part of imperial propaganda during World War II. That's why most people probably have heard the term kamikaze before. The idea that an uh, invasion that looks likely to succeed can suddenly de- be defeated against, you know, all hope was obviously a very useful fiction for the Japanese Empire. But in, in any case, the bulk of Mongol forces had left by the 20th abandoning all gained ground and retreating back to Korea. But this is, regardless of what happened, this is like a very weird historical event. Like, you have a force of 22,000 people, they show up, and then within less than 48 hours, they are gone. So, like, regardless of what happens... Whatever, how how much I mean, there's are there was probably at some point some storm, whether that was big rain or a, a you know typhoon, tornado, hurricane level event. We don't know, but there was some combination of a storm and a battle, and what ratio those were in, we don't know. Regardless, they were enough to send the greatest empire on the planet uh, with heading off with their tail between their legs. The defeat in 1274 did not end Kublai's designs for Japan. There are a few series of important events that occur in after 1274. Um, open warfare between Mongol factions breaks out between Kublai and another one of Genghis Khan's grandsons, a, a man by the name of Kudai. Um, and you have a sort of political divide in the empire between traditionalists who think that Kublai is sort of losing his Mongolian nature, becoming too Chinese and losing, you know, the way of the step that had made the Mongols strong, and, you know, those who supported Kublai. Um, In that context, accepting permanent defeat against a minor power such as Japan would be seen as justifying the arguments of the anti-Kublai traditionalists. In 1279, the Song Dynasty is finally defeated, which also gives Kublai access to a new source of both troops and ships for the invasion of Japan. But Hojo Tokimune did not spend the years between the first and second invasions idle. He would raise taxes on the Shugo to pay for the construction and reinforcement of fortifications throughout Hakata Bay, most notably a large stone wall facing much of its shoreline. And these fortifications, while not grand in size, would provide Japanese archers with valuable protection from Mongol arrows and bombs. Um, Hojo Tokimune also organized a system of coast watchers and tasked the samurai of Kyushu with spending a portion of every year manning the defenses of Hakata Bay. And he also spent a lot of his new money raised on by taxes on building a whole slew of new Buddhist temples. You know, this is something which we people in the modern day might see as wasteful, you know, building temples with money you've raised to defend the nation. But for devout Buddhists, such as Hojo Tokimune, you know, building these temples was a way of defending his nation. And modern scholars often forget how much religion matters to ancient peoples and and to modern peoples. Yeah. (laughs) This is a level of statecraft and, like, Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a level of exercising power over your state and concentrating uh, st- military and, and bureaucratic strength that Japan will not see again for quite a while. Oh, yeah, for, uh, for certain. You know, the direct taxation on the Shugo alone was something very unusual. Um, the Hojo traditionally relied on quote unquote gifts from different important families. To sustain their wealth. Having an actual system of taxation is was totally new, and organizing the Japanese state to this level is something which, yeah, we would not see in, in Japan really until the end of the Sengoku period. Now, Kubai sent more envoys to Japan during the interim, um, but his final group of envoys sent in the late 1270s were actually executed under the orders of Hojo Tokimune. And if you know anything about the Mongols and their envoys, executing Mongol envoys is kind of like, that's something that really pisses them off. <laughs> that's a good way to get them very angry. 
And that was an affront to Kublai that he could not ignore. This sets the stage for the invasion of 1281. Correct. A- again, it's um it's 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 really hard to know how many people that the Mongols send and how many ships because, you know, this is not like they're, they're not writing this down the way modern governments would, but it is possible that they sent as many as a hundred thousand people to uh, raid Japan. So this, this, it, regardless of how many people they sent, it's clear that Kublai is going all out on this one. Like, like a, definitely another magnitude uh, up from the last battle, and this invasion in 1281 is the one we're going to focus on so let's talk a little bit about both sides and what they're working with so we spoke before the mongols they're horsemen they live in the saddle they use these composite bows it's composite because it's built of multiple materials that makes it stronger Uh, this is a, a really big upgrade in technology from just simple wooden longbows and you move around on the horse, you shoot people with a bow, you're mobile, you're ranged, what more can you want? But uh, the Mongols, you know, they also use spears, they also use some sabers, and they've got this lamellar armor that um, was n- kind of categorized as not bad um, against arrows and edged weapons. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very good for the time, but it's certainly not perfect. Um, it doesn't provide perfect protection, but it's pretty useful against a wide range of threats. Um, Remember, these Mongols fight in units of tens, hundreds, thousands of tens and thousands, and this army, we call it a Mongol army, but we've got uh, some Koreans in here. We've got plenty of Chinese soldiers, including soldiers from the former Song dynasty. And they're going to bring with them the weapons they use, spears, bows, crossbows. Uh, and they're going to be organized the way that their nations traditionally organize themselves. You know, the word empire literally means conquering ethnically and culturally diverse peoples and that was always on display in the mongol empire which is far from a monolith at this point we've already talked about how they have gunpowder primitive bombs and once again they're going to be coming from a fleet provided by korea but here's a big difference we've said before this invasion was way bigger they've jay they've totally you know, uh, gotten the the Song Dynasty in Lower China uh, bolted down at this point, right? Yes. So those Song vessels and that all that Chinese great might that is also going to be used to invade Japan, and we're going to have one force of up to forty thousand people coming from Korea and a separate force of up to 60,000 people. Again, I'm a little skeptical if it was that many, but a, a huge armada coming separately from China. Correct. The one thing worth noting, because it'll become a point later on, um, you know, the Song Dynasty had a big navy, but most of this navy was actually really um, made up of coastal or riverine vessels made for operating on the large rivers of China. These were not ocean-going ships. And, you know, Kublai tasks the Chinese with building a lot of new ships. We actually have records that one of the magistrates in charge of this repeatedly protested to the court, saying it was not possible to build so many ships in such a short period of time. They eventually do, but it's quite likely that they did so by building much more simple river and coastal ships instead of the tough, big, stronghold, ocean-going uh, vessels, which would really be more ideal for such a large invasion. Put a pin in that Chinese fleet being a little slipshod. That'll uh, come in important later. So on the Japanese side, we have the samurai. You know, the bulk of Japanese warriors were samurai, 
And these people were professional soldiers. They were well-trained and skilled in the use of their weapons. The primary weapon of the samurai, as with the Mongols, was the bow. In this case, it's the tall, asymmetrical yumi, which samurai were adept at using both on foot and on horseback. When we say tall, this these bows are like like Europeans. If you, you like, we think about like the, the, no. The, these bows, are, they're, they're as big as the Japanese person who is wielding them. Yeah. And, you know, swords and spears were also used, though they were not the primary weapon. The, are, uh, I, I have to ask, because I'm a nerd, but are, are katanas around at this point? Katanas, as we know them, were not. Those come around a little bit later, around the 1300s. Um, these swords are often a bit thinner and a bit longer. Now, the samurai armor consisted of scale or lamellar and made up from very small pieces of iron. It was a bit more unwieldy than Mongol armor. If you look at Japanese armor from this period of time, it's very boxy looking. But it did provide very good protection from arrows. And just to give y'all a, a, a visualization, this lamellar armor, this is made out of, as Jay said, bits of iron and also lever that's kind of like... Lay, overlaying each other, almost like fish scales. Yes. Yes. And it helps d- deflect blows because it's sort of uh, layered o- over each other. This is very d- uh, different from, say, full European plate mail that's that's uh, popular on that side of the world at the time. Now, remember, these samurai, these are professional warriors. Like, this is their, their place in society. Th- very similar to, to knights in... Uh, medieval europe at the time and they've been raised from birth to do this they are sort of the the lower nobles and this is the way they serve the higher nobles the way they bring honor to their clans um individual glory is a major motivating factor to these people Partially because, you know, you want to be a cool guy, but also this is how you get paid. In order to prove that a samurai had done well in battle, you had to physically bring back the heads of the people you killed. Uh, so next time you're thinking about your your noble, beautiful, cool samurai, uh, remember that they've got uh, human heads dangling off their horse along with their kit. Um... Also acceptable is uh, testimony from a reliable witness who was with you. Uh, the samurai, they're not fighting in tight ranks like the Mongols, kind of more in sort of lo- loose groups along clan lines. So, like, you know, you, uh, you you kill somebody and you either take his head or you get your cousin Taro to vouch for that you were the one who did it. And that allowed you to... Um, get rewarded by your lord now now we said these people you know honor and prestige is a big deal uh i i'm sure you know it's kind of stereotypical in our culture to think of uh, japanese armor and bushido code but um jake could you kind of uh pop some balloons for us oh for sure i mean bushido is a whole nother topic which you could spend hours on but suffice to say honor didn't always mean fighting fair ambushes, night attacks, you know, sneaking up to somebody's house at night and lighting it on fire. Those were all valid ways to prove one's valor, and those are all things a samurai specialized at. Now, in total, Japanese forces on Kyushu probably consisted of up to 40,000 men by the end of the campaign. Uh, you know, throughout this uh, campaign, we'll be talking about more and more men were in, in were more and more men were arriving in Kyushu from the rest of Japan. And this would have been the largest concentration of forces probably ever ever gathered in Japan up to that point in time. Uh, for context, the Kamakura government usually maintained an army of only around two to 3,000 retainers at most. So the, the local lords and rulers of Japan have got to be utterly scared shitless if, if they are sending their armies to double, triple, go up by a magnitude the size of, of the, the regular uh, standing army. 
Yes. Like, we send in the boys from all across uh, the country. Yeah. And this is around 40,000 samurai. Is that also... Obviously, it's kind of only the samurai who fight. They don't really have foot soldiers in this part of the world exactly. Yeah, I mean, some of the samurai who maybe are low enough they can't afford horses would fight on foot. Um, you know, they would often invite people to kind of, like, join with them, these being less professional, you know, soldiers, usually just people going in to try to get some booty or some sort of payout. Um, but the bulk of the army is indeed samurai. And they might have some retainers and, and servants yeah. with them to help with the horses and whatnot. Yeah. So like we said before, the Mongols have split their forces into two fleets this is not like a tactical thing like we're gonna hit him with a pincer movement this is just like it, it's efficient like we can build ships in korea we can also build ships in china we're gonna send both we've got a northern fleet coming out of korea with roughly forty thousand men we got a southern fleet coming out of china with roughly sixty thousand men uh those troops are mostly uh, defeated song soldiers who need something to do and this is something for them to do Mongol command was split amongst three men, and uh, apologies, we are going to butcher all these names. We've got General Shindu, uh, a Korean admiral named Hong Tagu, and a Chinese admiral named Fan Wenhu. Yes. Meanwhile, the defense of Kada Bay and Kyushu as a whole was entrusted by Hojo Tokimune to a man by the name of Shoni Sukiyoshi. Uh, who had been appointed Chinze Bugyo, literally the defense commissioner of the West. And under Tsukiyoshi would have been the various Shugo of Kyushu and others sent to assist the defense of the island. Remind me real quick what Shugo means. The Shugo are basically the military governors. So these are people appointed by the Kamakura to take charge of a certain piece of territory. Technically meritocratic, in practice, these mostly became hereditary. For the first invasion, we kind of gave you like a really quick, like they say they came, they saw, they left. Here we're going to give you the full drama. So the Mongolian Northern Fleet set sail in May of 1281. Now the plan, their orders is to rendezvous with the Southern Fleet at Iki Island before they attack Kyushu together. Uh, now, obviously, the northern fleet out of Korea is closer to Japan than the southern fleet, and they're also going to leave first, which uh, is, is going to mean they're going to get there way early. Yes. You know, the Mongols from the northern fleet do arrive at Tsushima Island. They launch an attack on it, but actually fail to capture the island, whose defenses have been substantially upgraded by the Japanese in the interim. They are able to simply, though, bypass it and go on to Iki, which they do capture, but they end up kind of being stuck waiting for the Southern Fleet. As you mentioned, they leave or before the Southern Fleet does, and the Southern Fleet had been further delayed by logistical difficulties and poor weather. Poor weather that's heavily affecting their shoddy ships that they made. Yeah. Now, uh... So, they stay on Iki Island Northern Fleet for, like, a little less than a month, say, and, um... Yeah, a couple of weeks. Then they press on to Hakata Bay on the 23rd of June in 1281. You have this Korean Admiral Hong Tagu. He leads an attack on the island of Shika that's in the Hakata Bay, um, but... Then he was almost killed in the process by the Japanese defenders of the island, so... We, we take Iki, then we try to take Tsushima. That doesn't work so well. We wait a little bit longer. We say, ah, whatever. We attack uh, Shika. Then that also goes really, really well. And there's some light attacks elsewhere in Hakata Bay, but those fortified sea walls Japanese had constructed allowed them to repulse the Mongolians pretty easily. Yeah, you know, the Mongols are landing on these beaches, but they're immediately just getting peppered with arrows. And unlike in 1274, you know, their fire from, you know, the Mongols on the ground or from their ships is less effective. 
now that the samurai have better fortifications to, to hide behind. Remember, the invading army is going to always be an inherent disadvantage because getting off the ship makes you incredibly vulnerable. You're getting weighed down by the water, by the sand, the, the pit, and you know, I've hung out with tons of beaches, tons of lakes. Uh, certain sands on the coast can be almost like quicksand and mud, the way they can weigh you down. And these guys are wearing, like, what, several dozen pounds of metal on them as they're trying yeah. to do this. All the while, you're getting shot by arrows. Not a fun time. So you need an overwhelming numerical odds to break through. And because they only have the first half, which isn't even half, of their fleet, the northern half, and also they further split that up, they're not going to be very successful. Correct. And, you know, Hong Tagu decides to try to establish a new beachhead on the Shiga Spit, which is a little peninsula just to the east of Hakata. Um, he probably saw the peninsula as something which would be easy to defend, and it was, unfortunately for the Mongols. While they were able to land on the peninsula and secure it, the fact that it was so narrow meant the Japanese could very easily keep them trapped there. Yeah, so kind of imagine like a, a rocky jetty. Like, it's easy to defend, but it's also easy easy to, to keep you on it. In order to leave, you're totally exposed to arrow fire, and also you can concentrate your defenses at the mouth of it. It's just not a good time. So, we're technically on the board, but, you know, we kind of scored a field goal with this one. Yeah. Now, the southern fleet with Shindu and Thon Wen Hu arrived at Hakata Bay by mid-July, and they would attempt their own landing to the west of the seawall, and actually did manage to make it onto the beaches. The fortifications were a bit less strong in this area. However, the Japanese, who at this point were being bolstered every day by newly arriving samurai, opposed them with enough resistance that prevented this beachhead from expanding. So again, you have this small little beachhead, which you got some men on, but you can't get anywhere further. And we're in mid-July at this point, right? Correct. And as things are going to roll into late July, everyone's going to show up, and we suddenly have around 100,000 Mongolians. Uh, some of them are get to stay on the mainland, but most of them are going to be stuck on their ships. And this is where kind of the, the humor and the misery of this podcast is going to set in. Now, everyone loves to talk about glorious battles, campaigns, jumping over trenches and coming out of beachheads and my, meeting sword against sword in the Great Plains of Battle, but... Uh, the fact of war, uh, then and now, is that soldiers spend most of their time just sitting around. Yeah. And if you are a Mongolian horseman, uh, who gr has grown up riding on the plains of Central Asia, uh, well, one, like, th this is probably the first time most of them have ever been on a boat, correct? Yeah. And... If you're new to a boat, you probably get seasick. And that is certainly not going to be pleasant in the notoriously hot summer climate of southern Japan. You know, temperatures are probably easily getting into the 90s and the 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be like uh, upper 30s, lower 40s Celsius. I, I don't know fake numbers. Um... And th th things are just going to get utterly miserable. Uh, they're they're hanging out on these ships. How surely? So so the Japanese all they have to do is starve them out, right? Like how how much supplies could these guys have to hang out there? Now Kuboi has spent a lavishly on the fleet, which did, did mean that they did have several months of supplies. Um, However, these ships, as you mentioned, were not comfortable things to be on. They were probably very tightly packed by men, since you have to get 100,000 men across the ocean. You know, you don't. each man does not have their individual stateroom, let's just say that. And when you add together tight living quarters of a lot of seasick people and 
a society that does not have the sanitation standards that you'd find today. This all adds up to... Lots and lots of dysentery. <laughs> and the whole thing Don't about shit it. where you eat. The, I, I, no one believes me, but like... No, I'm not saying it's number one, but like... In the top five lessons of all of history is just don't shit where you eat. Over and over and over again. That is should be your number one takeaway of this in, of this episode of the podcast of the entire podcast. Lesson of history. Do not shit where you eat. Wash your damn hands. And to further the misery of the Mongols aboard the ships, you know, the Japanese didn't really have a big navy. They couldn't actually defeat the Mongol fleet at sea, but they had lots of smaller vessels, coastal vessels, and even like basically fishing boats. And what the samurai ended up doing is using these small ships to launch raids on the much bigger Mongol forces. You know, samurai aboard small vessels would pull up under the cover of darkness alongside Mongol ships and attack their inhabitants or attempt to set the larger vessels on fire. So you can imagine all the everything we've said about how shitty it is to be stuck on a ship with a bunch of other people getting dysentery and 90 degree temperature. And you can't even sleep at night because if you do so, a samurai might come out of the dark and cut your head off. Or throw a firebomb and set your ship on fire, leading you to jump into the water, which you cannot swim. No. And this tactic was so effective that the Mongols resorted to lashing their ships together to prevent them from being individually isolated and attacked. Now that, of course, is going to allow some of the disease ships to easily infect everybody else. So one problem solved, another problem made infinitely worse. And as May goes into June, goes into July, goes into August, this is uh, this is going to start getting really, really, really bad. Obviously, we we don't know the numbers on how many Mongols are going to die here, but... Like, I, I mean, surely at least a few thousand have, have died oh, yeah. from combat disease at this point. But, like, it's going to be increasingly difficult for the commanders to keep the men from revolting or getting them to, you know, let's, let's boss, we got to turn these ships around. And remember, uh, the, the Chinese forces are largely people from the army of the Song Dynasty. These are people who have just been conquered by the Mongols. They're... Not exactly the most loyal of soldiers, you know. The flip side of adding conquered people to your army is, you know, it's good for expanding your army, but it does also mean that they might not always be willing to die for the cause, so to speak. So by August, we have tens of thousands of Mongolian, Chinese, and Korean soldiers crammed into ships with food that is there, but definitely going stale at this point, which they are vomiting overboard because they're seasick and getting everybody sick with dysentery on top of being seasick in the sweltering sun as crazy Japanese samurai are setting their ships on fire and cutting off their heads. And this is all going to be made even more miserable by the massive typhoon that is about to kill tons of them. Yeah. And now we're going to talk about, you know, we had one before, but this is where we're going to get a very, very divine wind indeed. And this is something which we do have a lot of sources from the time attest towards this storm being genuine. Now, you know, anybody who's familiar, maybe if you're from North America, you're familiar with the Atlantic hurricane season. Typhoons are basically hurricanes. They're just, we we call them typhoons if they're in East Asia, in the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, like three weeks ago, it basically rained every day for like 14 days. And of course, it always starts exactly as I'm trying to leave work. Yeah, and and, and typhoon season is very similar to the Atlantic hurricane season. So it wasn't too surprising when in August, particularly on the 15th of August, a massive typhoon ended up striking Hakata Bay. Now, some of the sturdier ocean-going vessels, mostly of Korean origin, were able to depart the bay and make it out into open sea, 
But the vessels of the Southern Fleet, most of which were not ocean-going vessels by design, were annihilated by the typhoon. Uh, most of these were quickly built ships or repurposed riverine vessels. They often had flat bottom hulls, which were good for shallow water, but very unstable in heavy weather. I, as a marine nerd, I, I just have to cut in. The, the big thing... Okay, so like... The difference between a coastal water ship and a big heavy water ship is that uh, from the seas you hit much more intense weather than you'd get on the coast because there's no coastline, there's no land to slow the storm down and absorb some of its water. So in order to counter this, you have to build a ship that's got a giant keel. You know, that's that big wooden thing that goes way down into the water. Th these things will extend sometimes for dozens of yards down. And that is going to anchor this ship down, hold it down so it doesn't capsize and flip over in those big heavy waves and big heavy winds. That's what makes a ship truly ocean worthy. Now, that is, of course way way harder to build especially in dry dock you need massive superstructures of uh, scaffolding to build a, a a several stories tall hole and that is what makes ocean going shipbuilding so expensive so hard and something that requires honestly very technical knowledge that not everybody has yeah and that result is about a third of the northern fleet is sunk by the typhoon and probably over half of the southern fleet is sunk. Um, so that's just doing quick math. Uh, 45,000 people? Probably something like that, yeah. Uh, it seems likely that Shindu himself, the Mongol general, was killed in the storms. You know, the other two main commanders, Fan Wen Hu and Hong Togu, are able to retreat to Korea with the remnants of their fleet, but in the process abandoned thousands of their soldiers on the islands and beachheads of southern Japan. These men were promptly attacked by the Japanese, who killed or enslaved all of them. So a few weeks afterwards, Kublai Khan is going to get wind of this defeat, this second defeat, even more humiliating than the first. And this is going to be a major egg on face for the Yuan dynasty, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, this is something which... To be defeated twice is something that Kublai Khan cannot easily accept, and as a result, he almost immediately calls for preparations for a third invasion. So, that's it. We're going to move into the part of the podcast where we're going to talk about the third invasion? Uh, well, not quite, because ultimately, plans for this invasion would be scrapped, as his empire increasingly found itself embroiled in a series of conflicts on continental Asia. You know, throughout the latter part of the 1280s, the Yuan Dynasty became embroiled in a war with the twin kingdoms of Vietnam, as well as engaged in further campaigns in Burma and Thailand. Um, the uh, the jungles of Vietnam, uh, famously not exactly the easiest place for empires to conquer. Yes, and the Mongols would definitely learn that lesson, as you know, the French and Americans and Chinese would also uh, much later on. While these wars ended with the local rulers temporarily accepting the nominal authority of the Khan, they proved to be very costly for the Mongols. And all the meanwhile, the Khanates to the east of China were able to effectively break free from any sort of centralized Mongol authority. These are those guys who were saying, Kublai, you've gone soft, you've gone Chinese, you ain't real OG Mongolian, we're gonna take our shit and go. And this is where you get the Khanates of the Golden Horde, uh, the Ilkhanate, uh, that are going to set up their regional empires and be defeated or be assimilated with by the folks that they are messing with. It is, is this the moment that the Mongol Empire starts to fall apart? Like, yeah. Can you kind of, if you lie a little bit, like link the second failed invasion of Japan to like the collapse of the whole thing? I mean. I would say that this Maybe wasn't the, the, the main cause, but this was one of the major events that happened as a part of this process. You know, Kudai and the Chagatai Khanate had technically rebelled against um, Kublai Khan a little bit earlier. But, uh, you know, this is a part of the general atmosphere at the time. And that atmosphere is not friendly towards centralized authority of the Mongols. 
in a rather amusing way, perhaps proving that perhaps proving that he had not learned a lesson from the two invasions of Japan. One of Kublai's final actions before he died in the 1290s was to launch a naval invasion of Java in Indonesia, which ended up in another defeat. <laughs> Is if you have a hard time invading an island, and if you have a hard time invading a jungle, surely what's going to go great is the invasion of a jungle island. It did not go great. (laughs) They were also quite handily defeated there. And we talk about the, you know, the Mongolian conquests. Like, this is kind of, besides, like, Silk Road trade and Indian Ocean trade, like, this is kind of like the first worldwide event to ever happen, like in the history of the human race, at least on the on the Eurasian continent. And the Mongols are seen in history as an almost, not, not supernatural, but an almost force of nature in the way they so quickly burn through land. But they had a weakness. A horse no go on sea. Sea hard. Sea very, very hard. Yeah, and you know... All of the things that we think of that made the Mongols so strong in, in war, their lightning fast speed, their use of surprise and of complex maneuvers, um, just how good that they were at surrounding and overwhelming the enemy. None of that was possible here. They attacked the same location twice, uh, which probably was a questionable uh, strategy. Certainly in, while well, Hakata Bay was a logical landing point, you really do think they probably should have picked somewhere else in 1281. Now, Kublai's eventual successor, Temurkan, managed to bring a measure of peace to his empire. He brokered deals with many of his neighbors, and he relied more on his status as being the Chinese emperor than being Khan of the Mongols. It was more acceptable for these surrounding nations to submit to the authority of the Chinese because many of them had previously been a part of the tributary system. You know, the result of that is that the Yuan dynasty was stabilized, at least for the short term. But the idea of a larger Mongol empire pretty much died with Kublai Khan. And I have to mention that the Yuan dynasty itself would only keep going for like another 70-ish years after that. Yeah, they, they would get, you know overthrown eventually by the Ming. Because as much as Kublai would want you to forget, uh, everybody knew that these were not Chinese. These were the Mongols. These were the foreigners. And eventually foreigners get thrown out. Yeah. But as disastrous as it is for the Mongols, back home, let's think about the victors. Hoji Tokamune, our boy, he just defeated the most powerful empire in the world twice and you know, with the power of god on his side surely he now has a mandate to begin a, a new era of centralized japanese power well not quite you know while hojo tokimune was emboldened by his victory the vast expenses of preparations for the invasion preparations that continued after 1281 because remember the japanese didn't know that that was the last invasion the mongols would attempt we know that in hindsight, but Hojo Tokimune didn't. He had to keep on spending to keep up, you know, the defense of Japan. And all of that drained the Bakufu's treasuries and prevented Hojo from giving the lavish rewards to the samurai that they had come to expect for their military service. Discontent with the Hojo would only grow into the early 1300s, resulting in their eventual demise as the rulers of Japan in 1333, when they were overthrown by the Yashikaga. The Second Mongolian Invasion of Japan is a strange event in history that is kind of the embodiment of anticlimax. It starts off with big battles and then gets bogged down in stalemate, waiting, surprise attacks, disease, discontent, and just as things got miserable, just as the Mongols might have been tempted to stage an all-out attack, a typhoon comes along and ruins the whole thing. In the aftermath, not only does the Mongolian Empire begin to fall apart, but this would also be the high water mark of the Hojo, whose clan rule wouldn't even outlast the Yuan Dynasty. This is why you don't see a lot of movies and dramas made to the Second Invasion of Japan. Why you don't see a lot of talk about most history. Because as cool as the setup is, as important as the event it is, as exciting as it started off, the Second Invasion of Japan is 
kind of lame. Most of history is lame. It's not that exciting. It's complicated and nuanced, driven by Byzantine minutia. This is a battle that was planned and executed poorly. Then when the disaster struck and glory was for the taking, it wasn't well capitalized on. Power devolved to local rulers, leaving the battle a strange bottle episode of Japanese history because no one is competent. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of No One is Competent. You can find us on YouTube under that name, as well as at twitter.com slash not underscore competent and anchor.fm slash no one is competent, where you can find links to the podcast on other platforms. Our individual Twitter accounts are at Azalea Wyatt for Wyatt and at Jaharis48 for myself. Additionally, you can reach us by email at noonescompetent at gmail.com, and our music is by the legendary Sam Bryce. Thanks for watching, y'all. See you in the next one.